Now before we open, let's, um, let's pray together and ask God just to, to really meet us in this place. We, we, we've come, we started our time together with quiet, we reflected on the Word of God, we sung our praises to God, we're opening to Him, but now's the moment where we're going to open His Word. And my hope is, is that as we talked about the soils last week, that the Word of God will fall in soil that bears fruit this day. And so, I just want us to pray and ask God to meet us in this place as we open His Word. Father, you know exactly where we are. You know what's going on in our lives. You know what we most need to hear. And so I ask this day, right now, that you would help us to be attentive. Attentive to you in this place. Attentive to your word. Open to the possibility of not only hearing, but acting on the things that we, we hear and that we need to do. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing to you, my oh God. I pray that anything that I say that would not be in any way honoring to you, that it would fall away like chaff, that it wouldn't settle. And only that which is good would. So use me this day to speak your word. And in advance, I'll give you thanks. In Christ's name. Those of you who are newer to Grace, you might not be familiar, but I think most of us here, we have this on the white crowd today, most of you who've been with us um, know that we've been making our way through the scriptures. We started in the beginning of the year, and for the first part of the year, um, we spent the time, 21 chapters, in a book called The Story, which is a chronological retelling of the scriptures. And uh, we spent the first 21 weeks looking at the Old Testament and getting kind of an overview of God and uh, His place in our world, looking at His story and then our story uh, in light of that one. And for the last, this is week number four, we've been looking at the New Testament. And it's been all things Jesus, right? The first five chapters of the ten chapters of the New Testament focus predominantly on Jesus, and as well it should have. I mean, Jesus really is the reason why we're here. And um, so we've been making our way through. And where we find ourselves now um, is towards the end of this public ministry. Just before we take a look at chapter 25, I just want to ask you, by a show of hands, how many of you have been able to be reading along the way each week in the story? And that's great. If, if I could encourage those of you who are not yet, and if you need a copy of the story, we have them, and we'll be glad to get you one. This is a great way for you to have a deeper understanding of the scriptures beginning to end. So if, if the New Testament is not all that familiar to you, or you know some, but you don't have a strong sense of how it flows, I just want to encourage you to read. I mean, right now we're reading about the life of Jesus. There is just nothing greater than we can be doing as a congregation of fellowship together. So if you're reading, awesome. Keep at it. If you're not, I just want to encourage you to be reading along the way. And then I, I just want to also say to those of you who, who may or may not be in a group, if you're not yet in a small group where you're processing these things, because all of our small groups are processing what we're reading and learning. Story. If you're not yet in a group, if you could call into the office, I don't see Darlene here today, but if you could call in and just say, hey, I'm not in a group, but I'd like to know what, what availability there is for groups. I'd like to maybe be a part of one here for the last five or six weeks. We would love to connect you. So enough of a commercial. I just have a heart for you guys to know the word and to be in community in the process. So as we open the pages of chapter 25, we are uh, almost at the very end of Jesus' uh, three-year public ministry. He has uh, retreated with his disciples as we open the pages here to a region that is about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so he's in the very northern part of Israel, uh, in the foothills of the Golan Heights. And 
place that he arrives at with his disciples is a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, as I said, his public ministry is almost over. He's going to spend most of the rest of his time primarily with his closest disciples. Now, what you need to know about Caesarea Philippi is like what Costco is to shopping. Caesarea Philippi is to religion. I mean, it has every variety of religion all in one town. I mean, if you were to walk down the streets of Caesarea Philippi in the days of Jesus, you would see the city littered with temples of the Syrian gods. You would see statues and monuments of the Greek gods. Caesar worship dominated the landscape. It was kind of a smorgasbord. There was a worshiping of any and everything. And so Jesus takes his disciples to the north here. And as that being the backdrop, he asks his disciples one of the most important questions he would ever ask them. In fact, the question he asked them is very personal and pertinent to you and me today. It's perhaps the one of, if not the most important question he will ask of us. And so that's what we're going to jump in here as we get started um, in chapter 25. So if you want to follow, if you have a copy of the story, it's on page 353. <coughs> Jesus and his disciples went to the village and went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? Okay, he's been traveling with them for three years. He's been investing his life. He's now talking with his disciples about who everybody else thinks that he is. They replied, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. Okay, so he's processed this information. He's getting feedback about what other people now here's the big question, the most important question, the one you need to think about. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Now he'd been traveling with them for three years, he'd been investing his life in a very intimate way with them. He'd been imparting all that he had. They'd heard his teachings, they'd seen his miracles, they'd been touched by his grace. So this question seems to be a no-brainer easy enough for them to answer. And in fact, it is. Listen to what Peter says. Peter answers. Of course Peter did. <laughs> You're the Messiah! <coughs> Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now he does this often, and we've talked a little bit about why he does that. I don't want to get too far off on that point today. But here's what I want you to know as he gives this answer. Peter gives the right answer. It is true. But as you're going to see in just a moment, um, he's going to have a wrong set of expectations with the answer he gives. See, he, he believes Christ, Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited promised one. But his expectations for what this long-awaited Messiah was going to do for him are very different than what he actually was going to do for him. Okay? He gives the right answer. But he has a wrong set of expectations for this right answer. Okay, let's continue. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. See, Peter answered the question, right, you are the Messiah. But what was Peter expecting from Jesus? He was not expecting a suffering Messiah. He was not expecting a Messiah who was going to be killed. He was not expecting a Messiah who was going to be rejected. He was expecting a Messiah who was going to help he and the others overthrow their Roman enemy. He was waiting to be the one who would be in he wanted his Messiah to come with a sword. And he wanted deliverance. And he began to rebuke him. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine the scene? You've, you're probably somewhat familiar with this interaction where Peter begins to rebuke him after he tells him. He said, can you imagine being Peter and rebuking Jesus? I mean, 
you've been with him now for three years. It's not some stranger. You know him fairly well. You know who he is. You know what he's all about. And you're going to take him to task. You're going to pull him to the side. And you're going to take Jesus to task. Really? It's not his wisest move. He had a lot of moves that weren't all that wise. <laughs> this was probably the least of them all. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter back. Get behind me, Satan. Whoa. I'm sure he's looking around like, <laughs> he changed my name to Rock. Now is he changing me to Satan? <laughs> Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely you. Does this sound familiar to anybody in any way? Peter wanted Christ to be who he wanted him to be. He wanted him to give him the life he wanted to have. He did not want to submit himself to a life that would call for sacrifice and quite possibly even death. He did not want the life Christ was offering him. He wanted something <coughs> And so he rebuked him, saying, Don't do it like that, man. Do it like this. And Jesus said, What has just come out of your mouth is evil. It's not even wrong. It's evil. I'm trying to instruct you about what is true and what is right and what I've been preparing you for for these last three years. And if you don't receive this like good soil does seed, <coughs> You are going to so greatly regret it that it's going to end in your own demise. Don't tell me how to be your Lord. I'm your Lord. You do what I say. Get behind me, Satan. Imagine what fear must have felt in that moment. I've been called a lot of nasty names in my life. And some of them didn't feel so hot. But I've never been called that. And if I'm sincerely trying to follow the Messiah and he himself calls me that, the only thing left to do is to fall on your knees and to repent. To say, you're right, I, I guess I don't know what I'm talking about. I guess I've been wanting this for so long now, and it's all I can really see, and it's all I really want. This isn't a stretch for you and me, is it? To want something so much and just hope that God will bless off on what you want? He'll just give you what you want, whether or not it's what's best for you? This is the place that Peter's in. And that's why he asked his disciples, who should have known better. They knew the right answer. There was just a wrong set of expectations with the answer. Because when Christ is the Messiah in our lives, he should just fill in the blank. But then when our lives don't go the way we want them to, then what? Then we want him to bless off on our agenda. And when that doesn't happen, there's frustration, there's disappointment. And there's wrangling to try and get him to do what we want him to do. And he will not do that. He is God, not we. He continues. Then he calls the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and he says this. Whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be my student, my learner, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. By the way, the cross is an instrument of death. It's not simply that thing we hang on to death to look good. You know? The cross, it's a, it's, a, it's a tool of punishment and death. And what he's saying to them is, if anybody is going to follow me, this is not a great way to get a lot of followers. By the way, I don't know whether you're familiar with this or not. This is not a way to attract a crowd. And yet he goes to the crowd and tells them what he's been telling his disciples all along. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel 
will save it. You got that? This is really important. If you're going to be a Christ follower, this, this message here is really important. It's one of the last things that he will teach. But it's super important for you and I. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. You know, in helping the crowd and his followers understand who he is, he's also trying to help them understand who they need to be if they're going to follow him. He wants it to be clear. He wants his identity to be clear, and then he wants them to be clear about what it's going to require of them. <coughs> I just can't take the good without taking everything else that comes with it. It's not a smorgasbord where I get to pick and choose the God I want and like on that day. And here he is in Caesarea Philippi with the backdrop of all of this idolatry. And he's saying to this group of people, listen, if you want me, it's going to require that you give everything you have. It's going to require that you sacrifice things that matter to you. You cannot come and follow me and stay in the same place and hold on to the same stuff. It will not work. So here you go. Against the backdrop of all these other options, here I am. If you want me, this is what comes with it. It is no surprise that there were not many in the crowd who followed after that. Jesus gives an incredible message of good news. It's just not always easy to hear. And what you and I have to understand and what you and I have to process is when it's not easy to hear, will we still continue to listen and more than that, Obey. The question is the most significant one that he asks here as he closes up his life in public ministry. Who do you say that I am? Before you answer that so quickly, make sure that your expectations are in alignment with your answer. It's important. Okay, now when he is teaching them and he is telling them the call that it's going to require, he refers to himself as what? What does he call himself? The Son of The Son of Man. The Son of Man. The Son of Man, you will see that phrase used 82 times in the New Testament. You know how many times he uses it to refer to himself? 79. Does anybody know where the origin of the word Son of Man comes from? Does anybody you get, you really get a gold star if you know this? Does anybody know? Daniel. Excellent. Gold star for you. I know you're excited to receive that. I want to read to you where this phrase has its origin in the scriptures. And after I read it, I want you to understand the connection he's making. He uses this phrase. It's the favorite phrase he uses to describe himself. He uses this phrase more than any other one when he's talking about himself, okay? Daniel has a vision, and in that vision, he sees the Son of Man. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, and he was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power, and all peoples and nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You have a sense of, of the significance of that term now when he uses the word son of man? 
The reference is to him, the divine one, the one who will be given authority and glory and sovereign power and all peoples and nations and men of angry, every language will worship him. His dominion will be an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. He's referring to himself as the Son of Man. Would you imagine that his enemies and opponents wouldn't necessarily be happy about him using this phrase? The religious leaders of his day do not believe him to be the Son of Man. It's blasphemous to them. They get angry when they hear him say these things. He says it 79 times. One of the next times that he will use this phrase will be when he is on trial. When they are asking him, who are you? Tell us who you are. Listen to what it says in Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 61. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am. They don't like that either. I'll get there in a second. I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fist, and said, Prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. They were not happy when he used this phrase to describe himself. He told his disciples this was coming. Now, when you process this and you begin to think about the nature of who he is and what he says about himself, you begin to understand that while many people believe many things about Jesus, he's wanting to make it very clear about who he is. He did not want people to confuse him as just the wisest rabbi of his day. He did not want them to confuse him as some good guy who comes and brings help to people who need it. He did not just want to be a prophet who had special authority and power. He is claiming divinity. He is claiming that he is the Messiah. Now listen, there are many claims that you and I can make. But when you make a claim, you have to have credentials to back it up. A lot of people say a lot of things. But if there's not much to back it up, their word means next to nothing. We're going to look in just a few moments at the credentials of Jesus. But for now, I want you to understand that the way in which he is describing himself is putting him in extremely hot water. Okay? Now, as he moves from, from the northern area in Galilee and makes his way south down towards Jerusalem, there's going to be the celebration of a particular feast. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles, by the way, is celebrated around this time of year. It's a, does anybody know how long the festival lasts? Gold star again? Seven days. Seven days, a gold star for gems. All right, so seven days of celebrating. Did you know that today is the last day of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles? It has been going on this week. It's one of three fall festivals. There's seven festivals or feasts on um, the Jewish calendar. This is one of them that come in succession, 21 days. This is the last of the three of the fall festivals. Now, does anybody know what it commemorates? Does anybody know what the Feast of Tabernacle um, is for? This might be good just for you to know. Does anybody know? It's also called Sukkot, which is Festival of the Booths. That might help you. Do you remember when the Israelites were uh, moving from a place of bondage and slavery in Egypt? And they were led into the wilderness and they lived there for a period of 40 years, eventually being delivered into the promised land, the land of Canaan. 
when they were uh, moving, this celebration, this feast is on God's goodness, even in the midst of their difficulties for providing for them out of nothing. It's about provision. It is a celebratory feast. It's a thanksgiving feast for how God, in the troublesome places of our lives, provides for us and leads us to better. Okay? Do you remember at the end of the Old Testament when we were looking as the Israelites were coming back from the Babylonian captivity and Ezra stood one day in the courtyard and he was reading the book of the law and they said, oh, we didn't know these things, we didn't know these things. And one of those things was the Feast of the Tabernacles. And so they set up their own little booths and they stayed in them for seven days. This is one of the seven feasts. Well, Jesus is making his way from the north to the south stops in Jerusalem, and they're celebrating. And there's all this stuff that's going on around him. And he's not there when the festival starts, but he arrives about halfway through. So he gets there, and when he does, he goes to the temple courts. Now understand, Jesus spent most of his life in public ministry in the north, in Galilee, in and around the Sea of Galilee. He spent very little time in Jerusalem. But as he makes his way to Jerusalem, and then towards the end of his public ministry and also his life, he goes to the temple courts and he begins to teach. And as he teaches, this is what happens. This is page 356 of the story that you have. The Jews there were amazed and they asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? He's here speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit whom those who had believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing the words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. Others said, He's not just a prophet. He's the Messiah. Still others said, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? <clears throat> Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Okay? Some think he's a teacher, some think he's a prophet, some think he's crazy. Some think he's a liar, some think he's a blasphemer, some think he's the Messiah. Who do you think he is? See, here's the question I want you thinking about as we move through this. Jesus asks his disciples directly, you see all the backdrop of all of these gods that everybody else around us worships? Who do you think I am? And what do you think that means to you? If you're going to confess me as the Christ, the Messiah, it's going to mean something. You cannot call me Christ and then treat me as if my life has little to no significance for you. If you're going to call me the Messiah, it's going to ask something from you. I'm asking you, who do you say that I am? And when you get clear on what your answer is, make sure your expectations are in alignment with your answer. Because it just may well be that what you're trying to do is to create me in an image that suits you. Take me for who I am, Jesus says, 
Well, don't take me. Well, Jesus is going to make many claims about himself. Called himself the Son of Man 79 times. It was his favorite phrase. In the book of John, John's Gospel, there are seven times where he uses that I am statement. Remember that statement where when Moses was with God and he was having that conversation with God and God was saying, you know, I want you to go to the Pharaoh and I want you to go to the people and I want you to tell them that I sent you. And he's like, well, who are you? And he said, well, tell them I am sent you. Oh, yeah? I am? That's all you've given me? I am? I am means many things. It's multi-tense. It means I was. It means I am. It means I will be. It's an infinite word. It's a word that has no beginning and no end. I am. Well, in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses this phrase, I am, seven different times. He says, I am the bread of life. Right? We looked at that last week. I am the bread of life. Those who are hungry should come to me, and when they eat of me, they will never be hungry again. I provide you sustenance. I provide you life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. You remember he said in John chapter 8, he was talking about how much darkness there was in our world, and how he had come to deliver us and to bring us into light. Well, God is the only one who brings light. He's claiming deity when he says, I am. I am the door, the gate. I am the one that the sheep come through to the kingdom of God. I am the door. I am the good shepherd, he said. I am the resurrection and the light. I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, the life. Truly, truly, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus is making it abundantly clear who he is. There is no escaping the claims that he makes about himself. You cannot look at the Gospels and walk away saying this man was a good teacher without believing that he was indeed the Messiah. Because a good teacher would never make these claims unless they were true. A lunatic would. So they are true or they are not. That's for you and I to examine. But once you come to that place where you say he is the Messiah. He is the great I Am. He is the Son of Man. Then there's something for us to do with that. You can't just close the book and walk away as if you've never heard it before. It means something to you and I that He made these statements. It should. The question is, He says, in light of all my statements, see, there is no lack of clarity about what Jesus is saying about Himself. I one time was sitting in a seminary class and there was a student who was sitting a couple rows back from me and we were talking about the divinity of Christ and she said, you know, a lot of people, his disciples and people who followed him and, and who, who were adherents of his said that he was the Son of God, but he never actually said that. And I said to myself, are you kidding me? That's all he said. How about John 6? How about John 8? How about John 10? How about John 4? These things he said of himself. Say what you want about him. Call him demon possessed. Call him evil. Call him a liar. But don't say that he didn't say what he did. He claimed to be the Son of Man, the Great I Am. He claimed to be divine. And you and I, when we hear this, we have to process and really deal with this. This isn't about accepting something in our heads and then walking away as if it's some part of our belief system, but it lacks connection with our life. This is about having a life of integrity and authenticity. When we say that we believe something, that we actually believe it. And it means something to our lives. There are a lot of people who believed a lot of different things about Jesus, but Jesus was very clear about who he said he was. Well, you get to this point where you say, okay, well, if that is true, if these are the things that he says about himself, right? I can say anything about myself. But I'm going to have to have something to back me up. Right? Yeah. We can say anything we want. 
I can say my team's number one, but if we never win, it doesn't do any good, right? Yeah. right. <coughs> my team is definitely not number one. <laughs> So here's what I want to say as we sort of bring things to a close. I, I want you to think about the claims over and against the credentials of the one who made them. See, the first thing that I think about when I'm thinking about, okay, all right, well, let me process this. He makes these claims about himself, but, but what are his credentials? I would say the first credential that he has was that his moral character coincided with his claims. He was sinless. Now, can you imagine somebody trying to sell you that they're sinless? I mean, just for a second, imagine you know somebody pretty well. You've spent more than five seconds with them. And they're going to try to sell you a bill of goods that they are without sin. That's not going to work very well, is it? And when we see the claims that he made, you know, we saw that he would tell his disciples that they needed to confess their sin and to seek forgiveness. But the truth of the matter is, that's what he told his followers to do. He, he never had to do that. I mean, John said in 1 John chapter 3, John said of him, in him there was no sin. This guy walked with him for three solid years. Could you imagine somebody walking with you for three years? They saw everything you did. And at the end of it all, when they're writing a letter to another group of believers, what they said about you was, in him there was no sin. He wasn't the only one. Peter, in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2 said, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Peter testified three years of the man. Paul then comes along later in 2 Corinthians when he's writing to the church there, chapter 5, he said, Jesus had no sin. You say, yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. So his friends and his followers, they're going to make him look good. They're going to give him good PR. They're going to try and make him look better than what he really is. In John chapter 8, he said to his enemies, Can any of you, can you imagine standing in a room full of people who hate you, right? Who are doing everything they can to bring you down. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Do you know what they responded with? Later they'd say, this guy's crazy. But they had no evidence with which to say, yeah, you remember, remember on Wednesday there was that, you know, there was that guy and you were telling that story. And, well, that was a lie, you know, you were way off base. You didn't do that. No, they had nothing to go on, okay? The last piece about his claim to moral perfection was that there were people, now this is, see, this is the distinction that I think is important for you and I when it comes to this area of, of our becoming holy, growing in holiness. When people who were abject sinners, who were publicly known for having wrecked their lives, when they came closer to His presence, they were compelled to draw near. They didn't feel more ashamed, more afraid, more judged. They felt what? They felt more love. They felt more acceptance. In the presence of one who was totally holy, these people came from all over, and with their own shortcomings, they felt free to offer them and to be released from them and to start again. I think the first credential when you're thinking about the claim of Christ is that his moral character coincided with his claims. If he lived differently... His claim would have meant nothing. He lived a life, a life of moral perfection. And nobody, nobody could give witness to the fact that it was any different. People who knew him and loved him and people who hated him. That's the first thing. Second thing, really, is that, and we see this over and over, he demonstrated a power over the forces which could only belong to the author of those forces. I mean, do you remember when he calmed the storm? He did this a couple of times, right? He's on the boat with his disciples. He's out on the Sea of Galilee, and the storm is raging, right? We talked a little bit about that last week. And, and he gets up, he's sleeping. They wake him up, and they're like, hey, what are you doing 
and sleeping room, he's going to die. And he gets up and he just says, and it's calm. And, and the disciples say, his, his disciples, his students, the ones who knew him best, they say, who is this? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? It blew their mind. They knew he was good. They didn't know it was this good. <laughs> he has power over the forces that only God could have power over. He turned water into wine at the behest of his mother. It was the first public miracle. He fed 5,000 plus. It was more like 20,000. With two fish and five loaves. Later, he would be 4,000 plus. With seven loaves. He raised at least three different people from the dead. He opened blind eyes. He caused the lame to walk and the dumb to speak. He had a mastery over the forces of nature that only God could have. I don't know how you could look at this man and say anything other than, whoa, whoa. Okay, now his claims are having some credentials. He has moral perfection. There is no sin in him. He now is exerting authority over forces that only God can have authority over. But the chief crowning credential of his, the one that trumps them all, does anybody know what that is? This one is not a trick question. It should be super easy. Resurrection. His own resurrection from the dead. Over the course of his life, there were five different occasions where he predicted he was going to die. And he not only predicted that he was going to, he predicted how it was going to happen, and he predicted when he was going to rise from the dead. He gave people ample information about what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, and how it was going to happen. And it fulfilled a multitude of different prophecies that had been given hundreds of years prior to him. This, of all of the things, is his crowning credential for the claims that he made to be Messiah. He was raised from the dead. Now, following his death, that frightened, half-hearted group of people who were called his disciples and who would later become the church, became emboldened and empowered as he would later give them the Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come and dwell not only with them, but in them. It would literally change the course of human history. If this man was not who he said he was, these people who saw and knew and who were witnesses to the truths that he spoke would not have given their lives, and many of them did, for the sake of the claims of Jesus Christ. They were too cowardly. They were too half-hearted. They did not have what they needed to go on the journey that he was going to call them to. But you remember when we started this morning, what he said to them about those who were going to be followers of his. Peter changed from being the one who wanted to talk him out of it to being one who was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy enough to be crucified like his Lord. So when you get to this place and you're looking at the life and the ministry of Jesus, it all comes back to one question. <coughs> Who do you say that I am? No, no, really. No, really. Who do you say that I am? Your answer to that will impact your life. For all of eternity. Now and in the days to come. We're not just playing with this stuff here. Jesus isn't just a good man and a wise teacher and a powerful prophet. If you're to take him at his word, he is the Son of Man who has been given authority over all people. He is the great I am. He is the sinless one, the Lamb of God, 
who takes away the sin of the world. You know, church, that should mean something to you and I about how we live our life on Monday. About when we leave this building and we go home and we interact with our husband and wife and children or our friends and our neighbors and our work mates. It should do something <laughs> to the way in which we engage one another. It should mean something. <clears throat> it should mean everything. The messages and the claims of Christ were taken by a small group of people and over a long period of time have been distilled out to you and me. The same gospel truths that we're now left with. And the question becomes, who do you say that he is? I didn't feel like I needed to linger a long time with the whole category of liar and blasphemer or deceiver and lunatic because you're here. If I were getting some apologetic discussion, I'd log a little more time there. I don't feel like we need to spend much time there. Really, we're in a building here where we've come to worship the Christ. But the problem I have with trying to give this message to you and to listen to it myself is this. I find myself sometimes like Peter, who can confess what is true, but have a whole set of other expectations about what you want from them. And when those don't work, it really creates some level of tension and angst and disappointment and frustration. See, Christ wanted to be very clear with one of his closest friends. When you call me this, it will mean this. Not this. So if you find yourself in a place where you believe and your confession is that Christ is the Messiah, that he is the Lord, but you're feeling some level of disconnection from all of what that means in your life, and you're wanting him to be something else, to bless whatever agenda you have, to, to trump your own hopes and dreams, you might want to just bring those back to him and say, are these yours or are they mine? These expectations. Because I'm starting to I'm starting to lose some sense of faith. I, I'm starting to lose some sense of hope in what I thought I had. And you know, what has to happen sometimes, and this is just coming from personal experience, sometimes you do have to lose the faith that you have in order to be given a true, more authentic one. Because we build our hopes and our dreams and our faith sometimes on the things that we want God to do for us. Not on who God is and what He wants. And there's a big difference. You say, but yeah, but I really want this. Say, yeah, I really know. I really know. But I can promise you this, having walked with Christ or trying to for these many years. He will never give you, He will never give you anything less than what He takes from you. Some of us are so afraid to venture into new places. We're holding on tightly to the things we have because we're afraid God's going to take us somewhere or Give us something that we don't want. And the truth of the matter is, He may well. But when you move into that place, what you will find is that He will never take away great to give you good. He will never take away good to give you bad. He will give you new, and it will be best with that season of life that He's given you. He can be trusted if he is the great I am, if he is the Son of Man, if he is the one he said he was, he can be trusted to be good in your life. You don't need to be afraid. You don't have to hold on to stuff, hoping that he won't take it away from you. If he's the Messiah, if he can open blind eyes, if he can cause the lame to walk, cause the dead to live, I think he can deal with whatever it is that's happening in your life right now and lead you through to a better place. But sometimes, when you want to go around, he says, no, no, let's go through. Let's 
just go through and you learn something about me and you learn something about yourself and you grow and mature and you become the person that I made you to be in the first place. I want to take you back to the last thing and then we'll close. Remember back in the very early part of the teaching where he's talking to the folks and he says to them, says to them the following, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel's <coughs> sake will save them.